what I want to just talk about and, and kind of plan for you or help you with is I've got a sheet that's here. You've got a folder and you've got some other documents and so forth. But what do we start thinking about? Okay, my sheet here has got burial. It's got open casket. It's got closed casket. It's got cremation. It's got open casket cremation. It's got closed casket cremation. It's got direct burial. It's got direct cremation. Have any of you have you started thinking about some of those things? Many of us now, unfortunately, have. Maybe a little bit more because we're looking at this outside force that's causing it to happen. Two reasons that basically somebody asked me to go through information is one, maybe we've had a, a loss of a loved one. We don't want our kids to go through this again, so we just want to get things in order. That's perfect. Betty was just talking about another gal that, that she had a visitation with. Was at the last seminar we did several years back. The information is still in her file, or filing cabinet, I should say. Daughter was there. They're now starting it because they have to. You know, the unexpected. What if? Second part of it is, okay, we just get it done with. The 105-year-old, maybe that's a little bit longer or a little more extreme, but I don't want to see you again. I don't want to talk about this again. It's something that is an inevitable that we will all go through, but the more that we can plan, and even if we don't have children, for yourself, for your spouse, and to be brutally honest with it, for us as staff of a funeral home. Because when we're sitting down and I say, is it open casket, is it closed casket? Is it embalming, is it not embalming? Is it cremation? Is it burial? Are our cremains going to a cemetery? Are they going home? Um, is the service going to be at church? Is it going to be at a funeral home? Is it going to be at a park? These are all things that you're in complete control of. We try to sit back, and I often use this poor example. This is why I bring the tall, physically fit gal with me. I'm the short, little, little chubby guy that's up here talking. We are meeting with you, you are putting your trust in us, and if you tell us to put on pink skirts and do backflips, this guy's not gonna be good at it, but he's gonna try. And, and the more that you can lay out with your information for your family and friends, the better off we will all be. How many of you have had a, a, a mother, father, uh, grandfather, grandmother that's needed nursing care? Have you had to deal with what's called Medicaid or Medicaid planning? Many times I'm meeting with somebody, and, and I often refer to, do you have an elder law attorney? Do you have somebody that helps to kind of organize all of your, what you work so hard for over all the years, into this magical bubble that if something happens, nobody can take it away from you? And many people say, and like my, likewise myself, there's an expense to that. I don't know if I want to do that. Well, if you're one of them that basically says, you know what, I've worked hard, but I don't have millions. You've got the most to lose if you've got a spouse, if you've got a child. There are options, and the sooner that you can kind of get the ball rolling in protecting some of those things, the better off we all will be you as families. I use an example, and many of you may be in the same situation. Through your career, you have experienced something. Well, 14 years ago, this coming Groundhog's Day, I lost my father. An illness came on. Dad was the, if I can say, stubborn German that didn't like to complain about anything, but didn't want to burden us either. I don't remember him being sick. Yeah, a cough, a sniffle, things like that as, as we were growing up. It, it truly was a, he was dad. He guided us. He was our strength. 
So at Christmas time, or coming to Christmas, we're up here, they're down by Oak Creek. Boy, Dad, you've lost a little bit of weight. Really, you lost a lot of weight. What's going on? I don't know. Long story short, January 4th, we got a doctor's appointment. January 11th, he walked home. February 2nd, he was gone. I don't mean to make that story sound like it could happen to us, but did we ever think that a pandemic would happen in our lifetime? It's one of those things that the more that we can kind of get in order, you know, what our wishes are and so forth, the better off we will all be. Okay? Sometimes I keep talking, and I, I keep going. You get the idea of this folder right here. It's all laid out. Okay? This is something that, one, will assist in the legal document preparation. Legal document preparation. Death certificates. Reports of final disposition. Social Security forms. Veterans. Veterans documents. Um, most recently, and my dad was a railroad retiree, there was a benefit through his employment that went to my mother. Some of you have work histories, you know, the old Buckstaff companies, um, Wisconsin Axel, um, Rockwell. Some of those still have benefits that are there, and the more that you can reach out to and check on some of those to maybe help a family member or a spouse, I don't mean to make that sound different because they're all family member, but even if you are a, a single, a, a widow, a widower, um, to be able to organize so that when a death occurs and we reach to clergy, to Father Tom, for guidance, we know the direction that we need to go. Okay? Anybody have questions right now as I keep going? Okay, I'm going to hit on some of the topics. Yeah, go ahead. That one there? No, it's a guide for us to create the legal documents, but that does not have to have a notary or a seal on it at all. No. And, and the other part of that is you've been given one. There are, speaking on behalf of our funeral home, you can go to our website. Some of us don't like computers. I get it. Sometimes we don't like them when they're even, you know, supposed to help out and so forth. But we've got right on our website, there's an electronic version that's there. You can type the information in if, if it's easier for you. Um, you can write it down, use it as a guide. Just put it on a piece of paper and use a filing system, but make sure that your family knows. There's often times that I'm meeting with families as well. I will say, do you want me to reach to Father Tom and get your information on file? Okay? You can do that. We can do that. 20 years ago, almost 30 years ago, when I started gathering information for families, some of them even had pictures. Now, I don't have much hair anymore, but... Remember the hairstyles of the pictures back in the 70s, 80s, 90s? Family has a loss. They come in. You want to talk about something to chuckle at when we've got a picture in the file that this is what the hair is supposed to look like. We can get that involved with the arrangements. We don't have to be to that extreme, but most certainly we can fill that out. One thing that helps us, or a service that we provide back, because when a loss happens, how many of us are thinking as clearly as what we would be on a normal day? Not many of us. Some of us may be better than others, but there was a meeting that I had probably 10 years ago. Information gathering. We then tried to follow up after the services. How did we do? It's important to us. You put your trust in us as a funeral home. We need to make sure that we're doing what we're supposed to be. This is the reason we're sitting here and trying to talk, to give back and give some advice, give some guidance and so forth. But how do we do? Well, this gal, 
she started talking. The notes that we had, she had actually, for herself and her husband, um, made complete arrangements, and they did what was called funding. I had all the notes. I said, do you remember the casket? She said, yep, beautiful blue. I thought I grabbed the wrong file. I'm looking and going through and going through, and I'm like, Mrs. Smith, my notes here in the pictures is it was a brown casket. If she could kick me in the rear end and launch me out the door, she would have done it. She was that upset at that time. About two weeks passed after we parted. She went back through her notes. Smart, I owe you an apology. What happened? Or why? And she said, my husband wore his navy blue suit from the day they got married. So I just listened to her. And again, as you've all taken time out of your busy schedules, these in, this information that's here, what I'm trying to say is we're not thinking so clearly. And if we're all of a sudden faced with an unexpected passing of somebody that we have to make arrangements for, or we want to make sure that our family is doing that on, their, uh, on what our wishes are, what's the only way to do it? Putting it down, getting it down, having it there. If that gal would have literally had to make those decisions at that time without having her prearrangements made, it wouldn't have been so smooth. Five years, almost six years, have we ever had any of those type of situations where the decisions are harder to make when a death occurs and there's not plans? There's a, there's a, when I started, again, we used to do calling to families, asking them if they'd like to meet with us to go through our arrangement services. It's not for everybody. Some days I come to work now, I've lost my friends. I've lost family members. Um, I don't want to talk about it. Sometimes it's like, you know, your best friend of so many years is gone. So how do we go about making those arrangements and so forth when something like that isn't laid out for us? not telling you that you have to do it by any means, but we just want to help to give you the opportunities and so forth. Many people think, okay, here he's talking, and, and what's happened to our economy? What's going on right now? You know, going to the grocery store and buying groceries, the prices are going up. Lumber, cost of lumber, through the roof. It's come back down some, but we are an industry where there are a lot of people that do utilize wood products. Guess what's happened in our industry? Some of it's gone up. So that being said, as we see what it used to be back in the 70s, 80s, 90s to where it is today with the expense, many people think, I just can't do this because I know that they're going to charge me. They're going to make me pay for this. And I want every one of you to know that if you go to a firm, Conrad Bellman, ABC, XYZ, and they make you pay for your arrangements, please, please, please shop around. Talk about the different types of services. Look at the different options that you have. There's nothing that makes me smile more when I can go through and complete one of these planning guides, get the wishes down, get the scriptures, get the verses, and we put it away, we're done, okay? That, in that situation, has laid out everything for Father Tom, my wife, my husband, my son, my daughter, no matter what, it's there. Now granted, our next of kin is the one that has the ultimate say, but when we've gone through that and we've laid it out, I'm gonna go with 99.9% .9 of the time, this is what the decisions are. The kids and family members don't change much. 
And to me, that's a good feeling. Does that percentage seem high, Carissa, or is that pretty much the way it goes? I would say that's the way it yeah. goes. We many times worry about things being changed. The only things that we can't control, big one, a pandemic, two, dates, times, and I guess here in Wisconsin, we've got Badgers, Packers, and Brewers. So if they fall on to when our services are going to be planned, we might have to adjust a little bit. Um, but the, the point of it is, is that having everything laid out that way is hugely, hugely beneficial to you and your families. Um, one of the documents that you have, and this is part of Wisconsin. It's called the Consumer's Guide to Planning a Funeral Service. This document, this document is mandated if you go into a funeral home and you start talking prearrangement options, whether it's in-house funding, protecting a life insurance policy, or some other asset that you have, you must be given one of these. Makes us look a little bit silly as a, as a firm when the document right on the top says March 2016. The name of the organization is the Department of Safety and Professional Services. This document has been modified. For those of you that have had the experience of a mother or father, or grandmother, or grandfather, somebody needing Medicaid or medical assistance, nursing home care, this has a great way of laying out what you can have, but just please know that this document is a little bit off with the numbers. You'll see right in the very beginning, it talks about $4,500. That's the maximum allowed in a bank trust. Trusting refers to who holds the money, so you want to prepay. It's held not by a funeral home. It cannot be in Wisconsin. So it's held with a bank or credit union, if the bank or credit union has the option, and the maximum in that method is up to $4,500 in a funeral trust. If you're looking traditional burial, you can have a casket and a vault. There's also back-end items, obituaries, death certificates, flowers, luncheons, pastor's honorarium, ladies that serve or set up cleanup at a church, those type of things. So when this method talks about the bank funding option, there is an option too. The option three is you've got an outside life policy. Okay, I'm going to give you a worst case scenario of a life policy situation. And this is where I ask you and beg you to call and ask the question because everybody's situation is different. There isn't apples to apples and apples to oranges when you're talking about my home versus Mr. and Mrs. Smith's home. Everything's different. So being able to protect things, it's done differently with everybody. So it's a wonderful way to start the ball rolling and talk with a neighbor, but that neighbor's situation may be totally different. The worst case scenario that I want to portray, it was just a, a situation to where advice was given by a young attorney in town several years back. If you have life insurance and you are faced with one of the, your spouses, you or your husband, you or your wife, needing to go to nursing home care, and you have life insurance, and somebody tells you you can't have it, stop. Because you can have it. And you can utilize those life insurance policies to protect assets, not only in case of Medicaid, but to also get prearrangement credits or prearrangement guarantees, which protects funeral home services and merchandise. You can do that. Situation that I'm referring to, there was two $10,000 policies. Attorney advised surrender. Both Mr. and Mrs. received $3,500. Total $7,000. He was at that time terminally ill. Unfortunately, the daughter was the one that got the advice as a referral. They surrendered. She has $7,000. The funeral bill was $7,300. The daughter had to borrow monies to mom. I literally asked them in that follow-up, who gave the advice to do that? Well, it came from here. And 
the next question was, do you mind if I just call the attorney? And I did. If they would have switched Mrs. Smith's policy, or Mr. Smith's policy over to Mrs. Smith, transfer ownership under the spousal guidelines, there would have been $10,000 in place. Both of them would have had 10,000. Adds up to 20. They received 7,000. The mistake that was made cost the family $13,000. The attorney said, chalk it up, I guess I didn't know. If any of you have got $13,000 that you want to just donate to me so I can do some landscaping or something, let me know. But that's a tough one. The daughter was in tears. The point I'm trying to say is, get a second opinion. Call and ask the question and so forth. I felt terrible, and there was nothing that I could do. The attorney said, chalk it up. There's not everything that I know. Carissa doesn't know. Father Tom doesn't know. We, we lean on and rely on our professionals, our colleagues in our community, to give us guidance to be able to help out in those situations. It would have been eliminated if there would have been some more questions and, and things that would have went on. The, uh, the document that you've got here, why plan ahead, that's pretty self-explanatory. Give me one good reason I should plan ahead. This is not a scare tactic. This is the one that on the inside says 99 things. Well, not everybody's a veteran. Not everybody has uh, 38 different companies that stocks and bonds are in. But most of us have a home and or an apartment, have a banking account, those type of things. And we're here to help you to get that all organized. But this is something that comes forward that we all have to look at when we're kind of organizing. There's a booklet that we have, and I did not bring one of those because we just put another order in, but it's about a 50-page document that is 10 times what that planning guide is. It has questions and, and things to get you thinking about what do I want to do with this and this and this and this? Who do I contact, attorney-wise, financial advisors, you know, the, the legal people that, that help us with settling in a state, those type of things. We won't ask for names and addresses and things like that. We will lean on Betty to, if you have questions or you have information, you want to talk, um, we'll do that in a more personal setting and so forth to where we can guide you with some information. Um, but, but that being said, we, we are always open and, and welcoming to any of those inquiries. The Catholic funeral rule. Father, I don't know if you saw this in there. This is a document that one of our pre-need companies puts together. It's very, very generic. Um, and, and if you wanted to have any more of those resources, we can, we can get those to you. Um, Again, and I don't like talking about the pandemic, but what happened a while back brought the what if as a reality to many of us. And, and then things settled down, and things kind of got back to a little bit more of a sense of norm. And then the new, the new strain kind of starts going through our communities again. I don't think there's any one of us that really know what's going to be tomorrow. But we want to thank you for giving you, giving us the opportunity to talk with you and try to help you get things in order for the future. Conrad Bellman has been around. Some of you um, knew the Conrads. Um, Gary was a sailor. Um, there was Bill, there was Dave, there was Paul. They've all retired now. Fritz Conrad or Fred Conrad was Gary's dad. Bill Conrad uh, was Paul's dad. Uh, they have passed. But we want you to know that what they created for Carissa and myself was an opportunity to help every single one of your families. They were in town or they began their business back in the 1800s. We are most certainly not the, the go-to or the all-in-one 
because we are learning every single day with what we provide. Uh, some of you that may have or may have not maybe looked at our website, you'll see some things that we're starting to offer in our community. One of the documents that you have that's in your information for all the technical savvies and the ones that don't like the phones and computers and that, but it's called Vital Ice. Most of us all have medical, pract uh, medical practitioners, family doctors, whatever you want to call that, that at a moment's notice, people can access your health history. Again, this is something that we've put together that allows you to organize all of your information in one place. If we never ever met again, and you utilize this through this code, 1510, that's our funeral home number, 2311510, but you went to this app, you downloaded it onto your phone or your computer, and you put that in, all we want to say is use it when you can, if you can. It's a great resource. We've got a mom that lives in Oak Creek right now. She's had two hip surgeries, a third hip repair, and now a knee surgery because the pandemic happened. She went into therapy for 16 weeks, was doing wonderful, went home, everything was shut down, and she stopped doing therapy. I have access to this app. Any one of you that puts it together can list 10 different people on that app, children, grandchildren, brothers, sisters, something like that, as a resource for the what if something happens. Maybe we've got an allergy. Maybe we need to know what the medications are, those type of things. I know many of us are overwhelmed by the amount of things that are on phones. I'm not saying that I'm old, but this gal here, she knows how to do a lot more of those type of things than I do on the computers and on the phones because they're dealing with it on a regular basis and so forth. Everybody still with me? Nobody sleeping yet? I want to touch briefly on how to protect your assets from long-term care costs and funeral planning and Medicaid. I hope it never happens, but the way that our medical technology is nowadays, most all of us will need some type of temporary and or possibly permanent care at some point in time. When I started talking and going way back about attorneys, talking about those wishes, those type of items, uh, what happens to our assets? How do we protect those? This is what this basically comes down to. And in those two documents there, I hope not a single one of you ever need that, but probably half of the families that I meet with, I'm meeting with because they do have some need for extended care, rehabilitation, something like that. And we want to make sure that we're protecting the assets that you've worked so hard for. I won't do that personally, uh, meaning I'm not going to take an IRA account, which is an indiv individual IRA, and I'm not going to go messing with anything with that. But I am going to just stress the importance of your financial advisor, your accountant, and, and your um, attorney should know each other to the point where they're almost doing dinners together. Because what you've worked so hard for and what you've created in your portfolio is hugely important, and you don't want any of that messed up at all. So the parts that we guide with are how to protect should we need that type of care. That type of care referring to we're allowed only $2,000 in personal assets. We're allowed a burial fund, whether it's in-house or life insurance policies that's there. Beyond that, we can't have a whole lot. Well, what do we do with the rest of the money that we've worked so hard for? Kids? Spouses? Brothers and sisters? And all-inclusive siblings can benefit from what you've worked so hard for, if it's a last thing that you can do. I don't want you to get to that point of it's in a last thing that you can do. I'd rather it be where you've got it all organized and structured to where 
if something happens, the plan goes into action to where you basically are protecting everything that you can. Okay? Questions? Father, do you have any questions? All right, well, cookies and juicer. No, I'm just teasing. Um, when, when I'm talking about the, the importance of the information, and when I started talking about open casket, closed casket, cremation, burial, those type of things, do most of you, and, and just a show of hands, do most of you kind of have an idea of what you're thinking about? Or are there a lot of questions of, in, in this is what I get asked almost all the time. And we could take all of this and put it in the background at first, but are we curious on what the cost is? I mean, that's probably one of the biggest factors of why we make some of the decisions and so forth. When we start talking numbers, and I've got it in here, um, we're governed by what's called the Federal Trade Commission. We have got what's called a general price list also online, okay? This is a document also that whenever and whomever you meet with, if you start talking numbers, you must be provided a physical copy or an email address or access to a website of where it can be found, okay? I'm gonna talk about just a few of the numbers. If we talked a memorial service, memorial service means many times that cremation has been selected. With that being said, let's just say that a service with memorial is approximately including the outside expenses, honorariums, cemetery, things like that. Let's just say 5,000. We go to maybe a service that has um, the opposite end of the spectrum, where it's traditional burial. It all depends on merchandise. And you're probably looking at almost twice of what that cost is. Okay? Everybody in here is a little bit particular, a little bit different with what their wishes are. We're required to do certain things preparation wise. Carissa is open casket for the public signifies preparation with embalming. One thing that I found out is many families didn't realize that we don't need to be embalmed if it's just the immediate family. There's been kind of a, yeah, I guess it's the industry has had led people to think differently and so forth. I can see the wheels are turning with a lot of people's minds and so forth. I'm just touching very so slightly on the edge of all these little questions and things that you have. We've got some, uh, is, it, is it in the back now, Betty? Um, snacks and, and juice and coffee? Okay, yeah. So we'll have that in the back. I want to thank you. Thank you all for allowing us to come out and so forth. Um, we can be reached at any time at our funeral home. We can come to your home to medical, okay, like a donation to science, a donation to science, okay? Um, okay, um, so the question is, just elaborate a little bit about donation. Um, Truest form, what you're going to think of maybe is your, your driver's license. It has that sticker where it says, I'm an organ donor. If I can very generically explain that in the best case scenario, that is if our body is on life support, maybe there's an accident or something that has happened, and our organs are transplanted into somebody else. Many times death occurs and that doesn't happen. Um, then we have, and every medical professional coroner, medical examiner, nurse, doctor, whatever facility, they ask your family if you would be interested in tissue donation. Okay, that's option two. Um, donation to science is donating our body to science, 
Wisconsin, University of Madison, University of Milwaukee, medical schools, research for medical students and so forth. Um, so that can all be done. Those can all be pre-registered through the different organizations and or the tissue organizations as well, tissue recoveries. Does that kind of answer the direction that you're thinking or how is it done? Typically, typically the processes themselves are done pretty rapidly to where, you know, let's just say it's a two to three, three day waiting period before a visitation happens and so forth. It might extend maybe to a three to four. Yeah. Um, so that part of it doesn't really delay anything. Notice that if our body is sent out for medical, our body is gone. So we want to make sure that, you know, anybody that's going to want to have some private time before that happens has that laid out so that we know who needs to be contacted and so forth. I'd like to uh, just start by thanking you for being here as he did. Um, just thinking about this is not something we like to do. So thank you for your willingness to think about it. As he said, you know, it's a gift um, to yourself but it's also a gift to family and others um, by doing this. And we know that, you know, ultimately we don't want, at least I don't want to stay on earth forever. Ultimately, death is a goal at some point and, uh, and hopefully eternal life with, with God in heaven. That's, that's where I'm headed and, and I want to prepare for that. So part of what I'd like to talk about is spiritual preparation. So it's not what the reading is, but being ready for our death. Um, it's hard often to pray when we're not feeling well, when we're sick. And so to not be surprised by that or, or disappointed in that, but that's the time to let other people pray for you. Um, and so when people ask, what can I do? It's a real sincere answer. Please pray for me because I find it hard to pray right now. That's a wonderful thing to ask of somebody. Um, here at church, we have a number of ways of people being able to pray for others. So there's the prayer chain, so you can just call parish office and we just use first names. So we could pray for Joe, who's gonna have heart surgery next week. And that's as much of information as we give out. First name and whatever little one sentence that you want to add to that in terms of how to direct people to pray. And then people um, pray for those intentions. Um, at Mass on Sundays, we have intentions for those in need of healing. So again, you would just call the parish office. All that's done there is somebody's name. Um, in the back of the church, um, there's a book of intentions and there's a page for every Sunday and you can write in your intention there as well. After three of our weekend masses, we have people up front for prayer. So you're welcome to come up and have them pray with you, either for yourself or for someone else. That's what they're there for, is to help people pray. So that's called the intercessory prayer team. Next part are our sacraments. So the anointing of the sick in years past, it could only be done once. And then sort of my lifetime, it's been able to be done more than once for somebody who's advanced in years, for before major surgery or dealing with significant illness or somebody approaching death, okay? So it's not because I have a paper cut, but it is if I have something real serious going on, the anointing of the sick. And if somebody, for an example, is dealing with, with cancer, so it'd be appropriate to ask for that sacrament when somebody's diagnosed. So to pray for strength for that person, for healing for that person, as they prepare to begin whatever treatment there is. With the sacrament of the anointing of the sick is the sacrament of reconciliation. So those two sacraments are meant to go together. Um, so if somebody's not able to go to confession before the anointing, the church asks that they go um, rather soon afterwards so that, again, the healing 
comes from those two sacraments. Those are the two sacraments of healing, anointing of the sick and reconciliation. If you know that you or a loved one is getting closer to death, then that would be the time to again invite the priest to come and to pray, to talk, to celebrate again reconciliation and the anointing. And there's what's called viaticum, which is Holy Communion before someone dies. So that word means food for the journey. Often what happens is people wait until the person is dying, like within a few hours, and then the person is no longer conscious often, cannot eat, cannot talk. And so then it's too late for communion and it's too late for confession. So don't wait too long, you know, if you have a loved one. So when you see that, okay, we're taking a turn here, then that's the time to call and have the priest come so they can celebrate more of those sacraments. Again, reconciliation, anointing, viaticum. And then the priest can come back when it is real close to death. And there are some different prayers when somebody is actively dying. So there's some prayers, there's a beautiful litany that we pray for the person. Some prayers just placing that person in the hands of God, prayer of commendation. We and the other churches in town all have, um, make use of an answering service at night. So when the office is closed, um, the phones, um, so here at St. Raphael's right now, it's if this is an emergency and you need a priest, press one if it, that's what it is. I haven't called it recently. Um, and then that goes to the answering service. And then they will try to find me or Father Kevin, and if they can't, they will call the other parishes to find one of the priests. So just know that that's available. The priests help each other from the different parishes um, when, when somebody's not available at a certain time. There may be times when all of us are gone, though. So early October is one of those times when all the priests of the diocese are at the clergy congress. There's another time when we're all at a priest retreat. So I can't guarantee that we'll always be there, but we will do our very best to be, be there. But again, that's where if you don't wait to the very end, that's helpful. So that if, for example, somebody we're calling right now, Father Kevin is on, in Green Bay at a burial and I'm in the middle of a talk, so it'd be hard to go immediately right now. So that's the pre preparation um, for ourselves. And then I'd like to talk a little bit about um, the funeral rites themselves. So this book has all the prayers surrounding um, somebody's death and funeral, okay? And there's a lot in here for a reason, because the church encourages us to do it in stages. So we pray for the person who died. That's the point of the funeral mass, is the prayers are for the person who died. But we also pray for the people left behind to help them to grieve with a sense of hope. And so the church asks us to take some time to mourn. Um, the trend has been the exact opposite. Okay, so we're down to an hour or two of visitation and the service, and then we're all done. That's how almost everybody's doing it right now. And I think that's awful, okay? That's not enough time to grieve many, many years of a loved one. We need time to be with each other. So it might not be official things, but plan some things for your family to be with each other during those days so they don't get into town, you know, Monday night, have the things Tuesday morning, and then they're gone by two o'clock on Tuesday afternoon. Okay, they're going to be like, what, what just happened? So the church lays out different steps. So what I talked about when somebody's dying at the time of death, 
There are prayers. Um, there are prayers when uh, the person would come to church that Betty often prays with the family. One of the things that we've lost in the last few years is the wake service, okay? There's a point to having a wake service, and that is a time for people to talk to each other, both in terms of sharing of memories and just reconnecting as family. We're not doing that. The visitation for an hour you know, isn't enough for that to happen. And so we're trying to cram everything into the Mass. That doesn't belong in the Mass, okay? The Mass is the Mass, <laughs> and it's not a celebration of life with pictures and all that kind of stuff. You know, the Mass is what it is, and those other things are good, but don't belong in Mass. That's where the wake service is meant to be. So you can have that the night before, you can have it after the Mass. You can do a little bit of, of it for the visitation right before Mass. But make sure that happens and you give enough time for that to happen for your family, okay? It's up to you what you do. But don't shortchange the process of grieving by making it too quick. The, um, the form that Mark talked about, um, you know, can, can talk you through. And if you meet with one of the funeral homes, they will help you with that in terms of picking out those things that you would like. You know, which of those things you want to make sure your family has, and then you can plan for that. Um, in, so what I'm going to focus on now is just the, the church things. So the funeral liturgy itself could be a mass or it could be a service. If it's a mass in our diocese, it needs to be in church. Um, if it's a service, it could be at the funeral home or somewhere else. The service, the prayers are similar, um, but there are more prayers, obviously, for the mass. And we say the mass is the height of how we pray. So. Ideally, all of us would have a funeral mass. Mark talked a little bit about a casket or cremation. Um, so this handout was on the second cart um, that was put together by the Ashgosh Catholic Cemeteries that just talk a little bit about the difference from the church perspective. Um, and so cremation for the last 15 or so years has been allowed in the church. The preference is still for the cremation to happen after the funeral mass. Okay, that's the practice is a lot of people are having it before and you're welcome to do that. The church's preference is that it happen after the funeral mass. I gave a whole hour talk on this a few years ago, so I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail right now, but that's the bottom line of it. So it's allowed preferences for it to be after the Mass, and this pamphlet talks about that. Then the other thing for cremation is the church asks that there be a final resting place, which means that the cremated remains be buried or put into a columbarium or a, in a mausoleum, okay? So the church asks that they not be kept on the mantle, that they not be divided up among various people. So think of the urn, the contents of the urn as the remains of somebody's body, you know, so that's the equivalent of, you know, keeping the body around. The body's not there, it's, it's just part of that that's left. But, but ideally, there'd be a place where the cremated remains are kept in a permanent place for family members later to go and pray and to give respect to 
our bodies. We pray a lot for our body at our funeral as a way of giving respect to the person's life. That's how we come to know people. That's how they know us is through our body. Okay, so we want to honor that. Then the other sheet on the cart was this planning sheet with the St. Raphael letterhead on top. And as you can plan your funeral with one of the funeral homes, so you can plan it with any church, okay? So on here are some questions that are similar to what the funeral home will be asking, not nearly as many, but just what kinds of, do you have some prearrangements with a funeral home? And if so, which one? Do you have a place of burial chosen? Then which things would you like? So a funeral mass, visitation, visitation at the funeral home, other things. Your children might not go to church. That doesn't mean you can't have a funeral mass, okay? Again, the funeral is to pray for the person who died. So if you would like a funeral mass, make sure you make that clear to those who will be planning things. Then the rest of the sheet is um, some things for the mass itself. So music preferences, we have a sheet that we could give you with some options. You're not limited to those options, but those are ones that maybe are chosen more frequently. On the back side are scripture readings. And so again, for people who want to pre-plan this, then we would give them a book for them to use while they're doing that that has many different options for scripture readings. Um, Prayers of the Faithful, we've got another sheet for that. And then who would be doing different things? So if there's a casket present, um, there's a placing of the pall, the white cloth. Um, there's a remembrance or a eulogy that could be done. Technically, the church asks that there not be a eulogy at Mass. It's sort of allowed. There, I'm thinking at some point we won't be able to do that anymore if the bishop decides that but right now it is allowed. Um, and then who would do the readings? Who would read the, the intercessions or the petitions? Who would carry up the gifts? Next item is funeral lunch. So if you'd like to have that at church or have that somewhere else um, to sort of arrange that. The way we do that here at St. Raphael's is there are some people that um, set up and serve and clean up after the funeral lunches, but the lunch itself is catered um, by one of the local caterers. And then afterwards, um, if there are any memorials that you would like for certain causes to set up, you could do that to have masses prayed for you or lo your loved ones, if there are military rites. And then if you do this, then give it to us. <laughs> okay, so we have a filing cabinet with people who have done this, and then when they pass, we just pull it out, and we meet with their family, and we say, this is what your mother has chosen for her things. And as Mark said, most of the time, that's what is done. There may be some details that are done a little differently, and you may want to tell your children that it's okay to change some of this. This you can't change and these things you can so that they don't feel like, oh, if I don't get every detail right, you know, something bad is going to happen. And then tell your family that you've done this too, okay? So somebody in your family should have it and the church should have it. Just like at the funeral home, to meet with them and then they will keep the records but then your family needs to know so that if you die, for example, in a hospital and they ask what funeral home and you've set it up with one funeral home and your son says the other funeral home, you know, there's going to be some problems. So just communicate well, whatever planning you do, okay? 